go by the name of Drake. I already knew he was going to be the biggest star in the world. Hands down. After building a core team of collaborators in Toronto, Drake turned his attention to the United States. He needed key allies to help him achieve his goals. But getting love from American rap fans and labels had proven a tough thing to do for artists outside of their borders. The um, systems that would allow a Canadian artist or a British artist or a Nigerian artist to really get heard in the States on the same level as anyone else just weren't in place. I mean, radio was not open-eared like that. There is no streaming. You'd have to like order a CD and have someone would have to mail it to you. I mean, just think of all the obstacles for a foreign artist trying to get heard. Canada has had a flourishing rap scene since the late 80s, starting with people like Maestro Fresh West and Mishy Me, the first Canadian rapper to sign with a major label. In 2008, Cardinal Officials Dangerous reached number five on the Billboard Hot 100. There was like a ceiling. It was just like you could get so big in terms of like you could be a local superstar, but in terms of crossing over, which is what everyone wants to be like, on 106 and Park, be like on the big billboards in Times Square, that just didn't seem likely. So in the mid to late 2000s, hip hop is basically at its peak southern moment. You have peak Little Wayne. You have peak Rick Ross. You got peak T.I. You have all these artists who basically are on their third, fourth, fifth mature albums who are at that point the most dominant figures in the entire genre. The timing couldn't have been better for Drake. He knew how to use the internet to get attention at a time when the online music world wasn't completely saturated. I was a Cardinal official fan. He had a record with Drake a long time ago, and I think it was on Digiwax. Once the digital world came about and blogs started posting music of, of artists that weren't on the radio but had great sounding records that should be on radio. As Drake started growing, the masses didn't know about him. And it, when I say the masses, I mean, still he's talking about the radio people, club promoters, concert promoters. They didn't know about him yet, but we could feel this energy bubble. I know by the name of Drake. We would not have taken Drake as serious if he had signed to a Canadian label early, in the early out when he was shopping for a deal in 05, 06, 07. But at that time, our system wouldn't have been a good home. There was still kind of like a, an anti-urban stigma within the, you know, the major label side of things. You know, international urban's great, but no one's trying to mess with domestic. The appetite for it was, I don't think, was there. What's interesting to know about Drake's career is that, you know, some of the things are really strategic and then some things are just pure, you know, serendipity. So essentially what happens is, is that, you know, Jazz Prince, who is the son of Jay Prince, and in hip-hop circles, Jay Prince is kind of like one of the first southern hip-hop moguls. So his son, Jazz Prince, hears Drake on, on MySpace and brings that music to his dad and, and kind of says, you know, hey, you know, this guy's really talented. From what I understand, you know, Drake is having his hair cut in the barbershop and, you know, Jazz has only heard a couple of songs from Drake's mixtape and um, calls him up. Yo, we're doing an interview. All right. Cortez Bryant, co-CEO of the Blueprint Group, CEO of Young Money Entertainment. Yeah, that's me, music executive in the last 15 years. We were in Atlanta, jazz. We was just like, yo, yo, Poe, you got to hear this new kid. You know what I'm saying? You got to hear it. And I just remember being in a hurry, having to get somewhere. That was what, comeback season mixtape. He popped it in, and I was just like, yo. We told Wayne about him. 
And um, he was on the next flight. When I met him face to face, boy, I was like, man, no tats. I was like, this, this is a winner right here. She. The thing that jumped out to me about him was, I was like, damn, he rapped this good and he's so clear. He speaks so well. Like, this shit sounds eloquent. Sit back and admire the talent that I possess. Top notch, no less. Oh, yes, I'm known in the city, but need to bust out like a mile. He was so charismatic, right? And I was like, this guy's a star at that point. I think the details of my, my like, background kind of came afterwards. I think what caught first was the music. And I think what became almost more appealing was like, this is the guy. His lyrical capabilities just stuck out, you know, in his delivery. We didn't even get to any records where he was really singing. Later on, I, I listened to uh, Brand New and everything else he had out there, you know, that was uh, singing records, but this was just him strictly as a rap lyricist. You know, I didn't even know he sang until probably when we met him face to face. I think what catches you immediately about, about Drake is, you know, how melodic it is. And he has a voice that is, um, you know, soothing and, and nice to the ear. And he had a lot of different cadences and it was immediately evident that the guy was really talented. Once Drake finally came on the road with us, and you're around the studio and Wayne just sitting there, you know, he might be like, oh, come on, come and jump on this. And once they started making that music together, you know, it was a rap, you know, Wayne saw how good he was. Normally, of course, you know, he was working with 40, which is his main engineer, producer, all of that kind of stuff. So I got to the point where I'm working with Wayne every day and then they flew him in and literally he sat on the couch like the whole time. Like I'm recording and Wayne does like marathon sessions. So Wayne's in there from, for like 12 to 16 hours. It's like 7 a.m. after working from 9 p.m. The, the night before. And um, he's like, hey, I'm about to leave, but record Drake. And I'm like, Drake? I'm like, who's Drake? Cause, <laughs> and I look over, he's like him, him right there. And, you know, he got up and he gave me a CD. Yes, this is the days of the CD. So Drake goes in the booth. It already had the hook on it. And then he goes in the booth and raps. <laughs> Wayne unpacked his stuff and was like, ah, oh, nah, you're not about to rap like that. I'm a rapper too, I'm a rapper too. So then the, sex the session ends up going on for like a whole another two or three hours. This is Lil Wayne at his peak saying like, this is the guy, this is the guy I'm gonna sign. This is who you should be checking for. And you just so happen to have the writing, the hooks and like the punchlines to back it up is just like, oh, okay, this, you're now in a different tier, you're now in a different league. Wayne at that time kind of still was a young, he wasn't by no means an old veteran, he was still kind of on his own Papa Sen. The two most prominent people he signs are Nicky and Drake. What do Nicky and Drake have in common? They're interested in wordplay, uh, they're interested in rhyme flow and patterns. They're clever, they're, they understand how to take the complexity of hip hop and also render it with some kind of centrist or pop appeal. And Wayne, rather than rejecting that, or rather than saying, oh, that's too much competition, like, that's gonna get in my lane, embraced it. There are many huge releases in Drake's career, but perhaps most important is the release of the mixtape, So Far Gone. When So Far Gone came, I was like, okay. Because, you know, we were traveling around. We were actually on tour, and they were recording a lot of that in hotel rooms, him and 40. And, you know, 40 would let everybody hear stuff, or Drake would let people hear stuff, and we like, this dude about to blow. You know, we put out that mixtape on our own. So I hired, a, I hired a radio indie team. I hired him a publicist. We put all the tools around him together to make sure that we marketed that indie before we went and signed a major label deal to drive the price up. Once he had Best I Ever Had, we you know, told him, like, this is just a single. This is your single. This is the one we're going to roll, because this is going to be your aesthetic in, in which you represent. She made me beg for it till she gave it up. And I say the same thing every single time. I say you. At that moment, you know, I knew what it was. Uh, my management partners, everybody felt it and knew that it was about to be an anomaly. So to me, the reason So Far Gone ends up in a lot of people's minds is the definitive Drake record is it's really the hardest kind of like uh, left turn. It, again, it doesn't sound like anything else that is really happening in, in hip hop or even in R&B. As people started to first use the term millennial, if you started to listen to what people said millennials are about and how millennials act, that album was a, a cheat sheet into 
the millennial mind at the time. On February 13th, 2009, Drake released So Far Gone for free on the OVO website. It was downloaded more than 2,000 times in the first two hours. So Far Gone is such an iconic record because I feel like, for one, it was his first one that people like really paid attention to. And then two, uh, people couldn't get it. Like, if you, had, if you didn't download it back in the day when he dropped it on his blog, you almost didn't get it because when he dropped that, CDs were still in. Drake was refreshing. You know, the first thing he did, you know, he rapped and sang. He changed the whole genre of R&B and becoming a hybrid that could rap well and sing well. What we know as old school classic R&B started to die out. That separated him from the rest of the pack. Just his skill set on being able to do both. Good morning, USA. Morning, everybody. It's DJ MV, Angela Yee, Charlemagne the God. We are the Breakfast Club. I think at a time when rap was real rough, real tough, real hard, I think he took the lane of your LL Cool J's, your Fabulouses, and catered to women. People know once you have that core audience of women, they'll always follow you. They'll always support you. Men are sometimes fickle. Women are gonna buy your tickets, they're gonna support you, they're gonna buy your merchandise, they're gonna you know, download your records. And I think that's the lane he took and it worked for him. And I think as a woman too, we can appreciate somebody like Drake who seemed like more sensitive than most people and friendly to the kind of things that we like. Like we could sing along with those songs and be like, oh, he's so nice and so sweet. When So Far Gone came out, every woman I know was like, yo, this Drake guy, this Drake guy, this Drake guy. Probably another reason I didn't want to hear him because every woman I know was always talking about him. So I'm just, you know, was naturally hating a little bit. This might be controversial speak, but I also believe he benefited from what Kanye had built via 808 and Heartbreaks. He didn't rap too much on it, so it left space for somebody to come in and really have their, have their way with it. And Drake did that. Drake did that quite well with, uh, with Say You Will. Before they told me to do me, and don't listen to anybody that knew me, because two have known me would mean that there's a new me. Drake, I just remember how he just was like, yo, you're going to see, you're going to see, you're going to see, and I'm just, I, I believed him. The joint with uh, the one when um, Bun B was on, that shit was crazy. That's why I never followed y'all suggestions. I just always did my own thing. Now I run the game. Yeah, I see. I like Uptown probably kind of one of them songs too, like, <clears throat> because he, of course, you know, like, a lot of artists, they don't really record together a lot of times, but I end up um, recording Lil Wayne's part, because like I said, I'm Lil Wayne's engineer at that point in time, and Wayne killed it. I remember just coming home with my initial, like, Lil Wayne verses that I had on some of the first songs I had ever done, and I was just blowing people away. They didn't understand it. They had never seen anything like it before. Wayne doubled down on his support by appearing on four songs on So Far Gone. Successful, Ignant Shit, Unstoppable, and Uptown. I knew at that moment, I was like, you rapping, you you out there bar to bar with the hottest rapper in the game right now, which Wayne was, you know? And I was like, we about to explode after this. And once they recorded that, I remember Jazz, he had it first. And he was like, yo, he was like, yo, Paul, you gotta hear this, you gotta hear this. We, we, we good, we won it, we won with this. You know, and I heard, I was like, oh shit. Anything Wayne touched or anybody did, Wayne did anything with, work with, those guys are gonna go up too. But that's not the first time a Canadian artist has worked with American artists. It's not a big deal. But Lil Wayne was at the top at that time. And to be like, everybody in the world, this is my guy, and it's Drake, the guy from Degrassi, I was like, oh, okay. Okay, this is, it. things just got real. When we did the show, So Far Gone had just dropped. In the process of booking the show, he was still relatively unknown. Right after we signed the paperwork, and booked the show. Yo, between Best I Ever Had and Every Girl in the World, things went bananas. She be jumping up and down, trying to fit that, fit that sand. Took a half an hour just to get that belt of fast sand. By the time the tickets went on sale, the tickets sold out in an hour. We didn't get a chance to execute our marketing strategy. It just took off on its own. All the artists that came out, the ushers and the trade came, you know, and I was just like, yo, this shit's really happening. A little Scrappy was confused. Everybody knew the words. The, yeah. the blog digital world hadn't taken full form yet. And so yeah. it wasn't on the radio. So Scrappy like, ain't no way folks know all these words. And I ain't never even heard of this guy. How do they know this music? So Far Gone went on to become one of the most successful rap releases of 2009. Drake. 
not only in Canada, where it wins the Juno for rap recording of the year, but also south of the border, where the single Best I Ever Had becomes Drake's first number one on not one, but two Billboard charts. Thank you so much. The R&B hip hop chart and the rap chart. After we dropped uh, So Far Gone Mixtape, everybody wanted to sign Drake. You know, it was a crazy bidding war, man. At the end of the day, uh, Drake knew he wanted to be, end up, you know, being with, with Young Money. We had a blueprint on how we rolled out albums that were successful for us and our other clients, uh, was Kanye and Wayne at the time. We had the blueprint, so we was like, you follow this blueprint for a couple of albums and you're gonna be dictating what music sounds like. Yeah, yeah. Drake's stardom was on a major ascent in the year that So Far Gone was released. That power put him in the perfect position to both lift up and benefit from his hometown, Toronto. A lot of people from the States on the internet act like they don't like Canadian people, but when I'm there and I'm like, I'm from Toronto, they're like, holy shit, you're from Canada? Like, Toronto, Drake's side of the time? I'm like, yeah, like, yo, let's do something. 